all right. Um, before we start the actual class today, one thing I do want to mention is I posted an announcement concerning Career Services. Career Services is a valuable resource that they have here on campus that really does a bunch of things for you, from professional development, how to, how to interview, how to create a resume, and so on. Uh, and they have workshops uh, periodically, plus they have counselors that can work with you, and they have job boards, and they have all kinds of things, more things than I can describe or probably even know. <laughs> all right, so I urge you to check them out. I did post the link uh, as part of the announcement, so you can click on that. Uh, I think I also posted a phone number you can call. And in addition, anyone wants a brochure, I have a brochure uh, specifically about work-based learning. And work-based learning is something that can be really a valuable um, addition to your education. Um, in the classroom, we can teach so much. Um, as you all know, you really learn and understand something when you start to apply it to, to real life situations. And as much as we try to make the examples and the problems in class realistic, um, you will get real realistic problems uh, on a job. And there's benefits for the employer, there's benefits for you. Um, many times they work around your schedule, many times uh, it has the potential to lead to full-time employment, not always, but sometimes. So it could be a real good situation. So I urge you all to check it out and you can pick up the brochure. Those students who are not um, uh, in, on the campus-based class, um, if you are on campus, you can come and see me during my office or, or you know, let me know and, and you can pick one up or you can just contact Career Services either at the URL or at the phone number that I indicated. All right. Any questions before we begin? Because we're sort of starting the second half of the, of the, of the, the year. All right. Um, the first half was devoted primarily to database design, where we learn and we discuss the best way to store data. And what do we mean by the best way? Because there's some criteria, there's some reasons why I say storing stuff in relational databases is the best way to store data. All right. I would say that it's best for a couple reasons. First of all, It lends itself to accuracy. In other words, one of the reasons that we store data in a relational database is because it eliminates redundant data. With redundant data, you always run the risk of having inconsistent data. Uh, that is, if you store something in two places, there's always going to be a chance that the numbers will disagree, and in one case it will be wrong. All right? so, Storing data in a relational database lends itself to accuracy because it eliminates redundancy, provided, of course, it's properly designed. That's sort of the catch, right? You have to properly design it to avoid the redundancy. And also, it allows you to establish referential integrity. So, we won't have any illogical situations like having an order without a customer associated with it, or an order for a non-existent item, or something along those lines. Re with referential integrity, we can guarantee that that doesn't happen. And what's more, because the database is the keeper of the data, not only can we guarantee it doesn't happen some of the time, we can guarantee that no application can force in, by hook or by crook, bad data. All right. So, these two things taken together indicates that it lends, to, to, uh, lends itself to accuracy. The other reason that it's the best way is the flexibility. And by flexibility, um, that comes out a couple different ways. First of all, the ability to expand the database as needed. Database designs and breaking things down into their entities and creating relationships is flexible. If you want to add something 
to it, um, it should be easy to change. Sometimes it might not require add changing the database at all uh, in terms of adding any tables or columns, but maybe just adding data. For example, if you remember the pizza example, we said that we had an order type table that contained whether it was dine in or carry, or I'm sorry, whether it was pick up or carry out. We said that it would be very easy. Pick up or delivery. Uh, I say pick up and carry out are the same thing. Pick up or delivery, right? We said it would be very easy to add another type of, of order type to that database. Uh, and that is, you know, like maybe dine in or something like that. So by developing these databases in a, in a proper way, we can sort of make expansion and adding new scenarios fairly easy. We can handle things oddball situations, like a student that takes 10 phys ed classes, all one credit hours, that normally a student wouldn't take 10 classes, but because they're not seeking a degree, you know, they won the lottery and are just relaxing, so they take 10 phys ed classes, all right? Uh, we can account for that in the database because it's flexible. It's not like we have a slot for four different classes that a student can take, and if they take more than four classes, they're out of luck. So there is flexible. And we can expand the database. If our tables are designed correctly, it's easier to add a new table to the database. We can handle all scenarios, like I said, even the oddball ones of, hey, we have a student that's taking more classes than I would have expected. And last but not least, and, and where this is sort of the hook into the second half of the class, or at least this portion of uh, uh, the class, is that we have flexibility of reporting and querying the database. Much more flexible storing when we are using relational databases than any other method that we might have. Now, remember, our whole purpose is to take the raw data and transform that into information. All right. That's really what IT, in essence, does. If you're going to change it to, you know, if you're going to boil it down to one, one statement, that's pretty much what it does. It takes all these raw facts and transforms it into something usable. Remember, data is just the raw facts. Uh, out of context, data doesn't mean anything. It's only when you take that data and do something to it do you transform it into uh, information. Now, what's important as far as transforming data into information? Well, guess what? Accuracy and flexibility, right? And this, in a way, is a repeat of earlier in the semester. Accuracy, you know, one of the oldest sayings, garbage in, garbage out. If the data is inaccurate, the information that gleaned from it can't be as good as it could be, right? If we have good data, we run the chance of, of having good information. Now, again, then that information needs to be taken up and acted upon, all right? The other thing that allows us to uh, transform data in information, or the other thing that's useful in transforming data to information is flexibility. Because how do we do that? How do we transform data into information? Why, we do it by combining data. We do it by filtering data. We do it by summarizing data. We do it by, I guess, comparing data. All these are different things that we can sort of do. For example, let's run through a couple examples of these. Filtering the data. 
What do I mean by filtering the data? What's an example of filtering data? Yes? Looking at only certain aspects. Yeah, looking only at certain pieces, being selective. For example, in uh, a library, all right, and this is a good example I use, a library, a use of a, a, a list of every book that everyone has checked out isn't very useful, right? A librarian can't do anything with that, all right? A list of books, however, that are overdue could be useful because you could send letters to the people, you could call them on the phone, you could revoke their library privileges, and so on and so forth. So in that case, the whole data is every book that anyone has checked out. All right? That's not useful, though. If we filter it and only look at certain data, that is, the books that are overdue, we have something that we might be able to act upon. Something, and that, that's more information than just a simple listing of, of all the books. We could do even, even more so, all right? We could do several different things. We could, for example, combine, all right, and combine books out by person, right? Because, it, you know, if, if one person has 10 books out for a month overdue each, that's a different scenario than one person that has one book out that's overdue for one day. So we could combine all of the overdue books out by person to see, you know, gee, who do we really need to, to, uh, to uh, uh, address. We could filter it further. We could look for stuff that's only overdue for more than two weeks, for example. Eh, if it's overdue a day, and eh, maybe, you know, the person just wasn't feeling well, didn't make it to the library. But if it's overdue for a certain period of time, you might want to be more interested in it. Summarizing the data is an important tool. And by summarizing, what you do is instead of looking at every single piece of data, you look at totals. All right? So for example, if we were looking at uh, um, students at LC, you know, a list of every single student probably isn't beneficial. All right? But if we summarized by major, or if we summarized by uh, geographic location or where the person is from, all right, that might give us something that we could, could be usable, you know, um, in determining a lot of different things, you know. How many instructors do we need to hire in a certain area? If we see that there's more people enrolled in a certain study, maybe we need more instructors in that field, all right. If there's a lot of people coming from a certain geographical area, or maybe if there's not a lot of people coming from a certain geographical area, maybe we look to open up a satellite campus in that area, you know, as we've done with, uh, where are they? There's one in Wellington, I think, and there's one somewhere else. Yeah, they're, that right. There, there's the one in Lorraine, the St. Joe's. I always forget about that one. But I think there's even another one still that might be coming down the line somewhere. Yeah, something. I, I, don't, I don't really remember. But the point is, is you're not going to get that you're not going to come to those conclusions by looking at a list of every student. You're going to summarize it and, and see by geographical area. And maybe you come to some conclusion of that. Or you combine things like the income level of a city with how many students attend LC. You know? So again, all these things by combining, by filtering, by summarizing can take that raw data, that pile of numbers and figures and all that and turn it into something that's usable, all right? Um, ideally, and I had someone correct me on this, I think on one of my YouTube videos, as I talked about transforming data into information, and someone said that's not the whole process. The next step is to take that information and to glean understanding or knowledge from it. And that's true, all right? But that's someone else's job, all right? That's the job of management, to, to take the, the data and to come to some conclusions uh, about it. Really, our job as IT professionals is to uh, be able to store the data in a flexible, accurate way and be able to report on it in a flexible and accurate way. And then management can go and do their magic and come up with their, their good conclusions. All right, so essentially, in database design, we take this 
compile a data and we break it down into all these entities and we store the relationships. Guess what we do when we start querying the database or reporting on the database? We combine it again. All right. Sometimes students get confused about this and think when they're designing a, a database, gee, if I'm printing out an order, I'm going to want to see the customer's address, so I'll put the customer's address in the order. No, you still put the customer address in the customer table. However, you can write queries to print out an order or whatever to combine things together all right, and, and show everything. Now, there's two main ways that queries get written. The first is via a, 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 a tool that's called QBE. And that's query by example. All right. The second is through writing SQL statements. And SQL is the language of databases. It's the language by which we interact with the database. Uh, at the most fundamental level. The interesting thing is, is all QBE is, is a way, a simple way to produce SQL statements. So we'll notice when we look at access, sort of behind the scenes when we do a query in access, we'll see uh, that the fact that a SQL statement gets generated. All right. It's just that it's e easier for people to pick items on a screen than to actually write the SQL statement. Writing SQL can be difficult and take some practice and take some learning. Your average person uh, isn't going to just whip out a SQL statement. Um, however, your average person can typically learn how to do QBEs pretty easily. Let me show you an example of a QBE that you might be aware of. Fairly simple to be sure. But, it'll give you a sense of what I'm talking about by QBEs. Now, different databases and different applications um, do different, you know, have different sort of front ends to put these queries in. But I guess I would classify this as an example of QBE. Okay, I can enter in some criteria, all right, and click search, and it will return some data from the database. So, for example, I could say I want CISS courses. And I want them taught by Zellers. And I can go do a search and we'll see a list of courses that I'm teaching next term. Or Gee, I want a CISS course and I don't know the number of the course, but I want a course that's about Java. And it returns no results. That's a lie. Interesting. Oh, is, we're searching in fall. Why is it default to fall? There we go. There's the Java class. All right. So what we are doing, in effect, is we're querying the database. It is probably pulling together stuff from several different tables and doing this. For example, it's pulling together this information probably from a course table. 
is probably pulling this information from a section table. And it's pull, probably pulling my name from an instructor table. And there's relationships between all these. Now, notice we didn't write a SQL statement to do that. All right? Because, again, you can't expect a layperson to understand the language of SQL. But you can expect a layperson to go in and choose some criteria and get the results. Now, behind the scenes, whoever developed this application takes the data input from that screen and generates a SQL statement that goes up against the database and returns the result. Let's look now at a, uh, the query by example tool that exists within Access. And let me pull up a database. Oh, we're not connected to the network. Peachy. Let me go and pull up a, a sample database that I have, uh, that I use for one of my other classes. And we'll use that to explore Access's query by example. Okay, I'm going to open up the Northwood sample database and we'll take a look at it. This database contains information about stuff at a school. It has courses, sections, enrollment, uh, faculty, faculty rank, location, students and terms, and then it has a whole set of relationships. Let's focus for now on this relationship between faculty and student. And if you notice, it's a one-to-many relationship, whereas one faculty member can have several students that that, student, uh, that, that faculty member advises, but each, fac uh, each student only has one faculty advisor. So there's a one-to-many relationship between those. Now, let's look at some of the queries that we can write. So in Access, the QBE tool you can access by going into Create and choosing Query. For now, we are going to skip the Query Wizard. We'll come back to that. Uh, I like to pick and choose when I use the wizard and when I don't. I don't always want to use the wizard because I think a lot of times it's just as easy to learn how to do it the long way and you can get the exact results you want. But there's a couple of very specialized queries that it's very easy to do with the query wizard. So we'll consider those a little bit later on. For now, we're going to go into query design. And when you go into query design, you get a list of tables similar to when you create relationships. So in this particular query, I'm going to pick that I want the faculty table and the student table. And that's it. All right. I want, I want to print out, what I'm going to get to is I want to print out a list of students, their first name, last name, and their faculty advisor's first name and last name. Now, notice that it drew a line between them. Because we had already defined the relationship and we set up that foreign key, this query designer knows that those two tables are related. So it draws a line between them. If it were to show these tables without the line drawn between them, then you need to hook them up like you do when you create relationships. You need to hook them up for this query. But again, if you've done a good job and designed your relationships first, then when you create the query, that step should be done for you, as it is in this case. Now, what I can do in this query by design is I can go through and I can pick the fields that I want to appear on the report. So for example, I can pick the student last name. I can just drag that down here. 
student first name, drag that down there, or I can navigate this way and say from the faculty table I want the faculty last name. From the faculty table I want the faculty first name. The bottom line is I can specify what columns I want to see. Again, one of the things that we do, I suppose this is a form of filtering, but one of the things that we can do to transform data to information is to eliminate any of the stuff that we don't need to see. So if we just want to see a list of students with their faculty advisors, there's no need for us to display other stuff that will just sort of clutter the issue and get in the way. So what I can do in this query by example is I can pick the tables that I want the data from. I can pick what columns I want to see. As long as these two tables are joined together, I can then go and run the query and it gives me the resulting list that combines the data from the um, student table with the data from the faculty advisor table. To get back to that query design, I can go up under view and pick design view again. Let's go and add a couple of things to this. Let's add the city and the state of the student to this. And I can click run and it shows a list of students from different cities and states. What if we wanted the office of the professor on this as well? If we look, the office of the professor is stored in this location table. All right? So if I wanted to see on this query, in addition to uh, the name of the student and the name of the faculty advisor, if I wanted to see the office of the faculty, I could go in to design view again, right mouse, say show tables. I could then pick and add the location table to it. And notice it drew, whoops, it brought that location table in and it drew the line between faculty and location. One thing, when you're creating a query, there's going to be a chain of tables. All right. Um, if there's a table that is not connected to the other tables, nearly all the time that's bad. All right. I can't really think of a case where you would have that. Nearly all the time it's going to be bad. And we'll show you what, what, the, what the symptoms of that are. Now I can go in and I can add to the end of this report the building code and the room. I'm just switching the order of those things a little bit. And now I can see, run it again, and I can see not just the name of the student, the city and state of the student, the first name and, or the last name and first name of the faculty, and then I can also see the, the office number, the room number of the faculty member's office. All right. So what we're doing, we're combining data. We're joining data from different tables together. Nowhere in the database is there a table that contains the student's name, the faculty person's name, and the name of the, the building and office number of the faculty person. Those are stored in three separate tables, right? Because that's the proper way to store it. We wouldn't want to store the faculty name and the office name for every student that's advised by a particular professor. All right? So instead, we store it, we create the relationships, 
but for reporting or querying purposes, we need to display it this way. So therefore, we can combine data from those tables and we can see all of those in there. All right. Now, we can go back to design view and we can sort this if we want. So we could sort maybe by student last name in ascending order, student first name in ascending order. Ascending order means from the lowest to the highest. So you're going up. What does that mean when you're talking about names and letters? The higher the letter, or the later the letter is in the alphabet, the higher it's considered to be. So in other words, Z is considered to be the highest letter in the, in, in the uh, alphabet, where A is the lowest. So if I ascend by student name, ascending order, effectively that's alphabetical order. Because the A's will be first, the B's will be second, the C's will be third, and so on. So if now I go and run this, I can run and notice that it's sorted in alphabetical order. By the last name, and then by first name. By first name will come into play if there are two people with the same last name. So for example, if there were two people with the last name of Doe, all right, um, John Doe would appear before Mary Doe because J is before M. All right? So we can organize this a certain way. All right? And we can sort it. Now the next thing that we can do with this is we can put criteria in. Let's say, for example, I'm interested, for whatever reason, only in the students that are from the city of Eau Claire. All right? I can put that in as criteria. And I can say, under criteria, only give me the students that l are from Eau Claire. And notice it puts, it might be a little hard to see, but it puts quotes around Eau Claire. Now when I run this, I don't get every student. I only get those students that are in Eau Claire. Okay? So that's pretty nifty. Pretty nifty thing that we can do with this. Alright? Now, here's the interesting thing. Alright? When I'm done with this, I can quit out of it. I can save the query. And I can give it a name, maybe something like Eau Claire Students. It saves that query in the database, and I can come back later and run that query and get an updated value. Let's say, for example, uh, John Doe moves into Eau Claire. And Sarah Miller moves out. We'll move her to Elk Mound. All right. So now when I run the query again, Sarah's off and John Doe is on. All right. Other databases call this query, a stored query, other databases call it a view. All right. So, um, I forget the exact term they use in our textbook. They, they call it something like a SQL view or a, 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 a view equivalent query or something like that. They call it in the book. I, I don't remember. But they sort of give it a goofy name. All right. Uh, I think that's in the 3.1 section. Uh, chapter 3.1, I think. All right. Anyhow, in other databases, this is called a view. Now, what is a view? A view is where you sort of predefine a query that you can save in the database and run at any time that you want and get the most up-to-date data. It's almost like a fake table. All right? 
Because I can treat this query like a table in the sense that I can create a report from this, I can create a form from this, and I could uh, create even another query from this. So once you store a query, it sort of becomes like a fake table that sort of pre -combine, uh, combines and has some preconditions on it of what data is going to appear in it. I can then use that view or qu stored query in many of the places I could use a table. Now, a couple things that are different. It's going to be a read-only query. In other words, I won't be able to add students this way. All right? But I will be able to view them. So now, if I wanted to, I could create a form for my Eau Claire students. And it will show me all the students. All right. It shouldn't let me change it. I think access typically views are read only. Access may implement that a little bit different. But if you notice, what I've done is I made a form from that. I could also go and write a report from this. So I could go for my Eau Claire students and create a report. And I could sort them by faculty advisor, for example. All right. Or I could go into design view and alter it and make it look the way that I want to. Other thing I can do is I can summarize in a query. All right. Let's say I want to see, let's look at another table. Okay, here's a good example. Let's say I want to see all the buildings on campus, or all the rooms on campus. So I could write a query that will show me the building, the room, and the capacity. So let's go in and write that query. So I'll go to create, query, I'll pick the location. And I could say, give me by building code, or show me the building code and room and the capacity. And run that. And it will show me, these are all the things in the CR building. These are all in the business building. These are all in the library. All right. I could sort that in some more logical way. I could sort by first building code and then by room number. And it'll give me a nice organized, this is all the stuff in the business room, uh, business building rather, organized by room number. This is organized by um, the CR building, organized by room number. Finally, the library, organized by room number. Now, maybe I don't want to see every single room, but instead I want to summarize the data and just see, for example, what the total capacity is all right, for a building. The total capacity for a building. So I just want to see the building, and I don't want to see every single room, but I want to see how many rooms are in that building, and I want to see the total capacity. All right? I can go in to design view, and I can click on, drum roll please, totals. And now what we can do is notice, watch, watch over here as I click on and off the totals. If I click off the totals, notice that something disappeared. If I click on the totals, I now have a fourth line that says total. Alright? And 
I can do two things with every field. I can group by that field, or I can count that field, or average it, or do something else. What I want, ultimately, is going to look like this. I'm going to want a report that shows the business building has 12 rooms and a total capacity of 400 people. The CR building has three rooms and a total capacity of 100 people. The library has eight rooms and a total capacity of 200 people or something like that. So to do that, I say I want to group by the building code. So I'll go here and I'll select group by for building code. For the room number, I'm going to select count. I don't want to group by the, 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 the room number because I don't want to see every individual room. I want to see a count of the number of rooms. And then lastly, for the capacity, I want to see the total of that or sum of all the capacities. So now when I go and run this, it shows me something similar to what I had here. There's the business building. There are seven rooms in it and a total capacity of 170 people. The CR building has four rooms in it and that is the total capacity. And the tiniest library in the world only has two rooms and can only fit three people in it. Not much of a library there, right? Two closets probably. One walk-in closet and one other closet. I don't know. But notice what I did in that query. I said that I wanted totals. To when you see totals, think that you want to summarize. When I pick group by, that's what I want to summarize by. All right? I want to summarize by, I want my totals broken down by the building code. And then for the other fields that you want to include, you have a choice of including uh, a count, which would simply count up how many rooms there were. Or I can sum and get the total capacity. I could, sum, I could look at the capacity and say I want the average capacity of all the rooms. I could say I want the minimum capacity. And finally, I could say I want the maximum capacity. And if I go and run this then, it'll show me that that's the total capacity, that's the average capacity for the room, that's the minimum capacity, and that's the maximum capacity. So what we're doing again is we're doing several things. All right? We're seeing a list of all the rooms, uh, uh, we're seeing a list of all the rooms, but we're not seeing each individual room. We're seeing totals that include all the rooms broken down by um, building that they're in. And we're seeing the average and all that. And I can call this buildings. All right. I could write another query, all right, that would show me uh, rooms that are above a certain size. You know, let's say I, I have a meeting and I know there's going to be 30 people at the meeting. So I want to look to see what rooms on campus can I fit more than 30 people in. So I could go and create a query for that. For the location. And I could say I want to see the building code and the room, and the capacity, and I want to sort by capacity descending. What will that do? It will give me the, the biggest room on the top, the one with the highest capacity, and down to the lowest one. So if I run it like this, I'll see at the top is my biggest room all the way down to my lowest room. Now, 
What I could do is say, okay, I don't want to see every room. Again, I want to filter. All right? So only give me the rooms that are bigger that have a capacity of more than 30. So I should put in greater than 30. And it will show me that those rooms have greater than 30. All right. Now, in the example I gave, I knew that my meeting had 30 people in it. All right. So give me a list of the rooms that are bigger than 30. Next week I might have a meeting that, that has 40 people in it. Or I might have a meeting that's going to, or a, a seminar that is going to need 100 people, uh, a room for 100 people. It would be kind of a pain if you had to write a different query for each number of people that are going to be there. In other words, here's a query that shows me all the, all the rooms with more than 20 uh, capacity. Here's a query for all of them with more than 25. Here's a query for all the uh, rooms with 30 and so on. What I can do is I can create a parameter to the query. All right. And what's a parameter? A parameter is a value that you're going to supply every time you run the query. So instead of saying I want the rooms with a capacity greater than 30, I'm going to say I want a parameter called seats, let's say. I'm going to say enter seats needed. And I'll tell it that it's a number. long integer, let's say. And then, instead of putting in 30, I can put in the name of that parameter. So the name of the parameter is enter seats needed. I include, code it, I include it in the square brackets. Enter seats needed. Enter seats needed. Now when I run this, it asks me, enter the number of seats you need. So if I type in 40, it will give me just those rooms that have a capacity of 40 or greater. If I run it again, and I have a smaller meeting this time, and there's only going to be 25 people in it, I can put in 25, and I can get a list of those. All right. The parameterized query is something that will be very valuable as far as your project goes. Because if you think of your project, um, chances are you don't want to have a whole bunch of different queries. You don't want a, a whole lot of queries. Instead, you can give a parameter that you can fill in every time you run the query. Yes? Okay. Okay, that's a good question. Let's answer that and then we'll wrap up the QBE next time, but we'll, we'll finish up by answering that question. Let's say, for example, the state one was, the, the question was asked like, the query I ran um, shows that, um, shows everything that has a capacity of at least whatever parameter I put in. Uh, and the, the, the question was asked, and it's a great question, well, some of those are probably not appropriate, right? In other words, I'm not going to put 30 people in a room for 150, all right? That's probably not the best choice for room, all right, because that's an, an awful lot of extra space. So maybe what I would do is I would look for the best match. Well, I guess you'd have to define best match. So I guess maybe we could say something like this. Best match would be, or a good match would be, 
it has to have at least the number that, that I need, right? So if it has even one less, it's not good, all right? But doesn't have any more than, let's say, 10 more, 10 extra seeds, all right? So, in other words, if I put in my parameter of 30, it'll look for rooms that have 30, that have a, a capacity between 30 and 40, all right? So yeah, we could do that. Now how would we do that? We could go in and say for our criteria, give me everyone where the capacity is greater than or equal the seats needed and where the capacity is less than or equal to enter seats needed plus 10. All right. In these queries, in addition to columns in the database, we can use computed columns. All right, let me expand this so that we can see the whole thing. So I can ask for those that have a capacity of less than, or greater than or equal to the number of seats needed and less than or equal to the seats needed plus 10. So if I go and run this, I say I need 30 seats. It'll give me just those between 30 and 40. That's a great question. All right. You took that a little further than what I said. All right. I wasn't filtering it enough in the first case. All right. Again, transforming raw data into information, part of it is understanding how I want to filter the data. And your point was a point well taken, that I don't need to see gigantic rooms, I just need to see within a certain range. All right? And if we assume the range is plus or minus 10, then we could, we could do it that way. So that's one way that we could do it. And what I like about this example is it gave me a chance to talk about the computed columns. All right? Because we don't only, or we can, we can go and we can do some computations in our, our statements as well. All right? Next time we'll, we'll talk a little bit about query by example, and we probably will get into SQL statements. Now, the thing is, is we've been writing SQL statements by using this query by example tool. If we look, if we go up to view and say SQL view, that is the SQL statement that we created. All right, select blah, 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 blah. What we will do is we'll learn how to write that directly, all right, without using the GUI tool. And we'll discuss a little bit about why we need to do that. All right, gee, if it does it for us, why do we have to know how to do it? Well, it's not always going to be there. All right, if you're a Visual Basic programmer or a C-sharp programmer, um, you're going to have to include these SQL statements inside your program. And oh, by the way, guess who's going to have to write those SQL statements? You. <laughs> All right? So uh, we'll finish up query by example next time, and we'll, get, we'll probably get into writing our SQL statements. All right. Uh, that's all I had for today. I will upload this example, and then we'll see you over in lab.